Welcome, everyone. My guest today is lead analyst Logan Motoshami to talk about housing demand, home prices, and mortgage rates. Logan, welcome back to the podcast. And do we have a very interesting topic today related to housing demand? Yes. You know, doing this for as long as I have, obviously, everybody knows I've created a list of all the reasons why home prices were supposed to crash every year since 2012. But now we have another one. The sexless men in America. Who knew? You you combine that with the silver tsunami. And there you go. As Meredith Whitney has said, that will lay the foundation of home prices to fall, not just short terms, but maybe for decades, because American men aren't having sex, which actually, you know, um, the funny thing is, is this has actually been a talking point of mine in the uh, previous six or seven years, but not in the fashion that Meredith thinks. Um, there are a group of young men in America that don't have their stuff together. And I always say that women in America are kicking, you know, so it's a good thing that uh, the women of America are rising up, uh, making more money. They have choices. So men who don't have a lot of game can't get women to date them and they can't get married. I don't think that's the foundation, though, for home prices to crash, because I would assume that they're not buying homes anyway. You know, and they have it. And oddly enough, today, of all the days, today we come and the NAR gives us the data. The millennials are back on top again. Who knew, right? The kids were pushed out because mortgage rates are, uh, got so high. And of course, younger people finance their homes more than, uh, than older people. So millennials have now regained uh, as the top spot of the top generation. So the silver tsunami now has, you know, this this creature, which was created in 2008, uh, which was designed for the 2015 to 2025 tsunami of baby boomers downsizing to millennials who aren't having sex, I guess, and are are buying avocado toast. They can't buy the homes and, you know, home prices have to crash. Ladies and gentlemen, it's all a grift. It has been a grift for 16 years. It's done by people that I would question, are they even housing analysts? And I say this again, that Let's go look at forecasts and models. My whole thing is about getting people to, let me read your forecasts in the last five years so I can get an idea of your models because models keep people it, like sane. When you are like an ideological person, then you, guess what happens? Hey, you know, you could say crazy things. It doesn't matter. And I think a lot of the deflationary collapse of the baby boomers are, are people that are, you know, there's a, there's a growing population for like a hundred years that always say America's already over investing because, you know, population growth is going to slow down. Eventually. But I mean, this takes it to another level to where men aren't having sex and the baby boomers are going to downsize. Most sellers are buyers, by the way. So when the baby boomers sell, they buy another house. I mean, just for let's, let's like not mention Gen X or anything, but it's these men these men sitting at home, you know, that's, that's now part of the group. So um, it's, it's, again, it, it's not shocking to me because I mean, for as long as I've done this everywhere I go, there's always a silver tsunami question. It is an un, it is the marketing grift that has been here for so long. Um, and I encourage everyone just go back and read Meredith Whitney's housing work analysis models, forecasts, then let's go forward because I, I, maybe I'm wrong. I don't believe she's worked in housing before. Our comments here are um, precipitated because she was on CNBC talking about again, this topic, she's on correct? CNBC again. Again, they're doing this. Why? Because if it bleeds, it bleeds. And here we go. Silver tsunami. Here we go. Sexless man. Here we go. So <sighs> I got to make it as 2024. 2024, it's sexless men. Home prices are going to crash because of sexless men. Let's put that onto the list. You know, so uh, it, it, again, the the majority of sellers are buyers, right? That the equilibrium of housing data, um, when we go back after 2010, why has inventory slowly kept on moving lower where the other cycles, right? Well, guess what? We didn't really have a production boom in the previous decade. Majority of first-time home buyers 
buy homes with mortgages. They do not offer you a house, right? So, you know, uh, one of the variable factors you could talk about in 2024, where even though inventory levels is not growing to where I, I would like it to be or, or where I was looking for, you could say that, well, since most sellers or buyers, you know, and if there's not a lot of mortgage demand, inventory could grow because that first time home buyer is not part of the general mix because it's mortgage demand. But in this case, saying the baby boomers are going to sell their houses and then buy and oh, not buy another one. And then you could say, well, the lack of mortgage demand, you, you have to realize that we don't have anything in the data that shows us anything of a tsunami nature. Um, and the new listings data is it, which I do not believe she probably has, because if we see a tsunami, we did have one period of time where we saw a tsunami. It was 2008 to 2007, forced credit sellers, people losing their jobs and being forced to sell is a valid premise because those people do not typically are sellers. They're not buyers, right? So they're coming into the market without effectively buying a house. So the baby boomer in that sense, and remember, our demographics are massive here, right? Ages 30 to 39 are massive. You know, the millennials and Gen Z combined are bigger than the total population in Japan. So I don't know if the U.S. is the best example for the next, you know, few years of a demographic deflationary spiral. Countries like Japan or China or, or Europe, their demographics are different than ours. So I, I just don't think this, this decade is, is that. You know, and we always have people die every single year. We have these uh, homes coming out to the market uh, due to probate, but it's not, this is not a tsunami factor. And and again, we've, I've, I've dealt with this because people said millennials can't buy homes, right? Millennials cannot afford avocado toast, so they can't buy homes. And yet they were the biggest buyers all the way until mortgage rates spiked up. They lost that title or the NAR data today, they're back in there. Of course, the total volumes of sales down because affordability. Now, affordability is, is a good topic to use, but but man, I, I, I tell you, if it hypothetical, if mortgage rates were like 4%, nobody's having this discussion anymore, right? So uh, our demographics are there. Ages 30 to 39 are massive. We have a, a, we have a good replacement workforce and a good replacement consumer and single women are buying. Remember, I, I, I was at this conference in 2017. It was a national women's conference. I think I was like one of three guys there. And I was saying like, ladies, you are kicking ass. And one of the reasons why I'm so bullish in America is because of all of you, because we do have a bunch of guys who just don't have it together and you're outnumbering them. And that's a positive, you know, because eventually people date, they have kids, they get married and you don't need like 25 million homes to be bought a year. You just need that 4 million core buyer that we've had. And God, we have 335 million people in America. We have over 158 million people working. It doesn't take much to keep uh, demand stable. So in that regards, it's just, it's this thing is like Dr. Frankenstein's thing. It just does not quit. It is 16 years now. And now we've added sexless men into the variable. So well, really, though, I mean, I, I'm really glad you brought up, you know, demographics have been sort of your your thing. I mean, you've been talking about demographics and that really drove the work um, and you're your, um, talking about 2020 to 2024 being such unusual years. And this was way before the pandemic. So you weren't considering we were going to have a pandemic in 2020. You you outline these years because of the demographic patch that would be coming of age of peak home buying age. Um, which you identified a while ago. But I will say, I mean, household formation is one of the things that drives housing. So if people are not, uh, you know, not getting married, not having kids, that does affect housing. Household formation data has been growing for some time, right? And again- See, the, And that's why we have you on. Yeah, and the, the, the buyer profile does not revolve around a single first-time home buyer. That's the thing. This is why I always say, unless I see someone's models and their demographic like forecast of sales, I don't take them seriously because we always we always talk about the pool of buyers, right? First time home buyers, move up buyers, move down buyers, cash buyers, investors. You put them all together, you take a sales trend based on affordability. I just don't see these people doing that. I see these people saying something, getting on TV, silver tsunami, secular man, home prices are gonna crash. Oh, can I see your economic model works with forecast? No, no, I've never done that. 
This is why my whole thing for the next 10 years is going to be, I want names, faces, forecast models. I want to read your stuff last year, the last 18 months, the last five years. And so far, zero. Why? Cowards, frauds, and my war with this group is just starting for the next 10 years. So I will prove to you, I will prove to everybody in America, you cannot listen to people who don't forecast housing or have any experience forecast housing. Just ask for their forecasts. Think about the rationale. I am a world famous, great chef. Have you ever cooked? No. So why do you think you're a world's best chef? You know, so again, we, 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 we do this for, and li and listen, trust me, there are, there are experts in America in housing that can screw it up too. I mean, remember in 2021, we, we were told that housing was oversupplied, that we were overbuilt, overbuilt. So with the vacancy data and everything where we are, we were overbuilt, right? So I just think. I think we have to get back into a world where, and I know, I know, and this is, this is the, the problem of me being alive in this century. In the old days, we just read scrolls and candles and we just give the information, but now everyone has to like hype things up and do dances on videos and stuff like this, just to get the word out there. And those people tend to get rewarded um, with attention, but they, they not, not really the experts in the field. So let's talk about home demand. Let's talk about home prices and what your model says about those things. So when we look about the equilibrium between supply and demand, when we see pricing weakness, really simple, inventory grows, weakness in demand, price cut percentages. That's why we created the tracker, right? For me this year, I was probably on the lower end of the price growth forecast because I have uh, negative real home prices. That means my price growth forecast is so low that adjusting to the equivalence of rent, that inflation is higher. That's because I'm I'm not a, a Fed pivot person, which is going to be the next topic. Um, but that's the equilibrium of how do supply channels work, right? And this is why I, I cannot stress this enough. I've literally drawn the same chart for so many years, Sarah, with that black line. And I'm, I'm telling people the whole housing dynamics have changed after 2010. So you have to create variables to where People list their homes and they feel comfortable selling, or you have a, an event like a job loss recession or some kind of stress things. And trust me, we will see it in the new listings data. We got this. No one is missing anything, right? And this is why we try to highlight that we saw a stress period in 2008 to 2011 and the new listings data was running at 250 to 400,000 per week. We're still in that 30 to 90. If anything, the new listings data slightly disappointing me. So it's just, we, we have models and we keep people informed because we don't want to do the, I will give you a forecast and I will not talk to you until next year, right? We, we, we hold everyone's hand. We show everyone the data because we have the access to it. So everyone has the idea, but I just, I just think hypothetical theories for attention gets way too much play. So let's get forecasts and models and trust me, they, Sarah, they all run away. They all run away. Nobody wants any of this. Absolutely nobody wants a ball up. I mean, to think about that, you would actually try to go head to head with me. And then I ask you, could I have your name and forecast? And they go, no, no, I don't do that. Of course not. Soft. So what about home prices? Well, home prices here, um, the growth rate of home prices early on was probably too strong for my forecast. And now that rates are higher and that the new listings data, I have a better shot of being right this year than being under. So we track the weekly data and that's why we do this every week. Cause what if mortgage rates start falling down again? Okay. Then I'm probably going to be wrong. What if mortgage rates start to go up aggressively and new listings data, then maybe I, I won't be, uh, I'll be wrong on the incorrect side, but whatever it is, we got this. We, nobody can miss this anymore. There is no surprise. There is no nothing out there. So as of right now, the price growth is slowing down. Why? Because active inventory is rising. New listings data is rising. Price cut percentages is slowly rising. Will it get to the highs of 2022? Probably not likely, but can it get to the highs of 2023 and maybe surpass us? That's a good shot, but we work with this weekly. So then everyone is on the same page with real data and not saying, 
sexless men are going to drive the home housing market for the next few years. No, come on. Come on. It doesn't work that way. And that's, again, and, and, and the reason I do this, I would challenge every man or woman in America, live debates, one-on-one, any day, 20%. I will get your forecasts. I will get your models. And I'm saying to you, I don't believe any of you. There's a very, very small sliver of our society that actually tracks housing data. I could tell you just by the first two sentences people say. I know. This fires you up every oh. time. Okay, well, let's talk about <laughs> Let's you talk have about no, you have rates. no idea how much this fires me up. I mean, it's just if there is one, if the, if there is like this energetic force of mine, it's to get every American man and woman to actually forecast and show their models. That is my whole. That is like my purpose for the next ten years. That gets me up in the morning. I cannot wait for it because then we get to see. Because what happens if their model changes on them? If they st- Go with it. If they don't, then it's an ideological thing. That's why I say models keeps everybody in line. So your sociopathic personality self doesn't take over and starts making up stuff. Let's talk about mortgage rates because, of course, we had it on our tracker. And we have had uh, Atlanta Fed President Bostic come out today. Um, we're uh, recording this on Wednesday. What's going on there? So there's a lot going on this week. We have technically broken above that key level on the 10-year yield and the intraday action on these headline reports. One thing takes us up, the other thing brings us down. This is the tug of war right about now. Remember last year when the 10-year yield was at 5% and I'm staying up till like one in the morning looking at overnight trading. We're starting to get a little bit uh, uh, action like that. You do have this at technical levels right now. Now, Powell came out. Uh, he had a, a, a speech set up and he was kind of saying, hey, listen, nothing really changes our mind where we're looking to, you know, the, the, the growth rate of inflation is falling. But, you know, I showed you that chart, Sarah, about the if you look at the growth rate of inflation versus the 10 year yield, the growth rate of inflation has fallen a lot, but the 10 year yield is still rising. Right. There is there's a huge gap here. And again, paper, rock, scissors, labor over inflation for now. Right. If the labor data starts to get weaker, the 10 year yield itself will start to trickle down and do the Fed's work early for them. But we're just at this point where the ADP number beat estimates, not that important in the general things, but it does move the market. The job openings are still historically high, but the jobs quit percentages is, you know, almost below two uh, percent. When you have a one handle in that and that's on a downtrend, that's where you start to raise you know, more red flags. So the labor market is clearly not tight. And then Powell kind of mentioned that about getting the balance back. You know, so right now, the last thing I saw, the 10-year yield is like a 4.35, 4.36%. So we're having a big tug of war here. But I would say one thing, uh, so far, the mortgage rate forecast in terms of where the 10-year yield could peak or mortgage rates could peak has been incorrect. Mortgage rates have actually acted better this year than I thought. I thought the spreads would probably get better the closer, the closer we get to the uh, first Fed rate cut in, in, in that matter. It's actually improved noticeably enough now that we haven't even hit that kind of seven and a quarter uh, uh, level, even with the 10 year yield getting up to like 4.42%. So uh, spreads are good. That's something that we want to think about down the line, because if we do get rate cuts and the market is is better in that sense, the spreads itself, just getting back to normal gets us 1%. That's a big deal because we have seen that the low six percentage the thing that, you know, Neil Kashkari has nightmares about, you know, because apparently men who have sex are going to buy buying homes, right? We always said this, people, you know, they date, they rent, whatever, they they have sex, they have kids. Neil Kashkari's like, no, 6% mortgage rates are a problem. Now, maybe that is going to be okay uh, um, and people live their lives. But the spreads going out, if it does improve more than than even I thought, that that's a, that's a material thing. If the economic data starts to get a little bit softer and the 10-year yield starts to go down, again, I, I can't get the 10-year yield below 3.37. That's the Gandalf line, but you don't necessarily need that. Better spreads, lower yields can get you sub 6% mortgage rates easily in that without having us even go anywhere near where the mortgage rates or the 10-year yield was in the previous decade. So it's, it's an interesting week. We have Jobs Friday coming up. Yeah, we have Jobs Friday coming up. So uh, jobless claims would have popped up by the time this podcast comes out. So it, 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 we still have some good uh, uh, reports, but it, is, man, it has been an intense week on the market front. And for those of you who actually uh, want to nerd out, because we have thousands of people now on, on uh, my Instagram page, we do weekly uh, or daily videos on the 10-year yields that kind of like try to show people 
what levels matter, but we also like to show the intraday reactions to, okay, this headline, that headline, this headline, just to give people an idea about what kind of really moves the market at this point. And you also do an update every day for our mortgage rate center where you talk about where you think things are going to head based on the early action. Yeah, that's that's trying to take the early data that comes out in my time, at least 5.30 or 7, and then kind of let it digest a little bit and see where the 10-year yield goes. And then, you know, like like I've always said, I'm not a mortgage-backed security person. I'm not slow dance between the 10-year yield and 30-year mortgages that has been trending together. So this, so we do talk about, you know, when the spreads are are, are wide or, or very good. But in this case, directional 10-year yield movements and mortgage rates kind of go hand in hand. So that's the early mornings are just to kind of give, okay, let's see what happens. But this is all the data that came out today. This is the bond market's reaction. Let's see what how the day ends up. I appreciate that so much. Um, Logan, thanks so much for being on. And a reminder to our listeners that Logan is one of our keynote speakers at the gathering April 21st through 24th in Scottsdale, Arizona. It's going to be amazing. We're going to have some amazing people on stage. Logan and I are going to do a live version of this podcast if you want to be involved in that. So uh, sign up. Oh, do we get to do like a, 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 a takedown of the mortgage rate lockdown part two? No, we are not. No? That's not the focus of this, of the podcast what, what, we're going to do live. What is the focus? Because obviously we can't talk about sexless men, you know, but you know, what's the, what's, what's going to be the focus this time around? We have a whole thing planned. We're, we will talk about that at All another right. time. It's not going to be the mortgage rates lock, lockdown. We're going to look okay, at Okay, so no mortgage rate lockdown, no sexless man. Okay, I, I, I know what we're not going to talk about. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for clarifying that. Okay, we'll talk to you soon. 